Welcome back to Calculus 2. I'm Dr. Jeff Grow. Today we're going to talk about sequences and series. Intuitively speaking, a sequence is a list, usually a list of real numbers for us. And a series is a sum. I want to make a distinction between these two terms. Forevermore in your mind, they are not going to be synonymous. In the usual parlance, sequences and series really mean pretty much the same thing, but no longer in your minds. From now on, a sequence is going to be a list, comma delimited. A series is going to be a sum. Our lists can be either, say, finite, or they might be infinite. We have to allow for both of these possibilities in our definition for sequences. That's going to require that we make another definition. By an initial segment, of the natural numbers, we mean a set of the form 1, 2, 3, up to some number n. So we have a, the first n natural numbers and then we stop. That's what an initial segment of the natural numbers is. So, a sequence is a function having domain either an initial segment of the natural numbers or equal to all of the set of natural numbers. If the domain is an initial segment The sequence is called finite. Otherwise, it is infinite. Also, let me make this formal. A sub n is going to be f of n for us. That's our function notation for sequences. Let me give you an example. Let's suppose a sub n is 1 over n squared. Then a sub 1 will be 1. a sub 2 will be 1 fourth. a sub 3, 1 ninth and so on. Let's look at another example. Let's suppose I give you the list 2, 4, 6, 8, and so on. You can see then a1 is 2, a2 is 4, a3 is 6, etc. What is the nth term of this sequence? Let's give a, a formula for the nth term. It looks like whatever you have as the subscript, you just double it. 
to n. That's the way you can describe the list of even numbers. If you're dealing with odds, then how can we describe the nth term now? These are just one less than before. So how about 2n minus 1? Suppose I have the sequence described by negative 1 to the n plus 1. What is this? A 1, in this case, will be negative 1 to the power 2, negative 1 squared. That's just 1. A2 is negative 1 to the power 3. You get three negatives there, so you get negative 1. A3 will be 1, and so on. So this sequence just bounces back and forth. At 1, you get 1. At 2, negative 1. 3, you get 1, 4, negative 1. 1, negative 1, 1, negative 1, and so on forever. Alternatively, if a n is negative 1 to the n, the only difference is you start at negative 1. Consider the sequence a sub n is the cosine of n pi. Notice that when n is equal to 1, we have the cosine of pi. If you think about the graph of cosine, at pi, you have a height of negative 1. a sub 2 is the cosine of 2 pi. That's 1. a sub 3 will be negative 1, and so on. I want you to remember the cosine of n pi is negative 1 to the n. Consider the following example then. a sub n is the sine of n pi. As you know, the sine of any integer multiple of pi is 0. So this sequence is 0 for all n. If we look at a sub n equals 1 minus 1 over n, you can see that a1 is 0. a2 is 1 minus a half, which is a half. a3 is 1 minus a third or two-thirds. One minus a fourth next, that's three-fourths. If you find a common denominator and subtract, you'll get n minus one over n, which is what we're seeing here. What happens in the limit as n goes to infinity of a n? These numbers we start out at 0, at 1, at 2, we have a height of 1 half, then 3 fourths, and then 4 fifths, and so on. They'll get closer and closer to, but never quite reaching, 1. It looks like the limit should be 1. We just need to be able to define what we mean by a limit for a sequence. The definition of a limit in the context of a sequence is very much the same as the limits for functions as x tends to infinity. Um, let me draw the picture. Suppose my limit value is L. The idea is that if we can go far out enough we can get as close as we want to the limiting value. And if you stay out beyond that distance, 
you won't stray more than epsilon away from the limiting value. So the definition is as follows. Given epsilon greater than zero, any positive number for closeness that you wish to specify There exists some natural number n such that if you choose some value at least that distance out, then the difference between the sequence values and the proposed limit value will remain within epsilon units. If the limit of a sequence exists and equals some value L, we say that the sequence converges to L. Otherwise, if the limit does not exist, then we say that the sequence diverges. As an example, suppose we have the sequence 1 over n. The limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n is obviously 0. What about a sub n equals 1 plus 1 over n to the n? What is the limit? This is a sort of limit you need to know how to calculate. We'll take the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 plus 1 over n to the value power of n. This is a 1 to the infinity case, which is an indeterminate case. We need to convert this into a L'Hopital's rule case. So the classic trick is e to the log. We can use properties of logs to get access to this exponent which we're going to put out front. Now, as n goes to infinity, 1 over n goes to 0. We get the natural log of 1, which is 0, times infinity. We have a 0 times infinity case, which is still not a L'Hopital's case, but it can be made into one. Also note that limits pass through continuous functions, and since the exponential function is nice and continuous, we can pass the limit into the exponent. We'll write this as the log of 1 plus 1 over n, and we're going to take this n and flip it down as a 1 divided by n. All of this is up in the exponent. Now we'll have a 0 divided by 0 case. That is a L'Hopital's rule case. As you can see, we'll have e to the limit as n goes to infinity. The derivative of log is 1 over, but we do need to apply the chain rule. The derivative of the inside is negative 1 over n squared, just as the derivative of 1 over x is negative 1 over x squared. But we're still dividing by the derivative of the denominator, which is negative 1 over n squared. The negative 1 over n squareds cancel. 1 over n then goes to 0. All that's left up in the exponent is 1. We get e to the power 1, or just e. If we try the limit as n goes to infinity of negative 1 to the n, well, what do you get? Remember that this sequence just bounces back and forth across the x-axis. And the limit, because this limit does not exist, it diverges. The sequence diverges. Let me give you a little notation. If the limit as 
n goes to infinity of a sub n is equal to L, we may write, there are several notations for this. One is a n goes to L. Another one might be a n goes to L as n goes to infinity, being a little more specific. Sometimes we'll just write a n goes to L as n goes to infinity, adding the phrase to the side. We can state a theorem very efficiently with this new notation. Let's suppose a n goes to L and b n goes to M. Then a n plus b n goes to L plus M. Go figure. It should be obvious that if you subtract, it goes in the same way to L minus M. If it's a constant times a n, it'll go to a constant times L. And if we have a n times b n, it'll go to L times M. What about a n divided by b n? We'll assume that none of the terms in the denominator are equal to zero. This will go to L divided by M, but that's only going to be true provided M is not zero. It shouldn't be surprising that since sequences are functions, they satisfy many of the same limit theorems as functions that we studied back in Calculus 1. So just like in Calculus 1, there is a squeeze theorem. If a n is less than or equal to b n is less than or equal to c n, and a n goes to L, c n goes to L, then b n must be constrained to go to L as well. As a quick example, suppose we have um, negative 1 over n, that's certainly less than or equal to negative 1 to the n over n, and that's less than or equal to 1 over n. Since 1 over n goes to 0 as n goes to infinity, the sequences on both ends here go to 0. It follows that in the limit as n goes to infinity, negative 1 to the n over n also goes to 0. Here's the idea. 1 over n goes to 0 like this. Negative 1 over n goes to 0 from the other side. Negative 1 to the n over n alternates back and forth but it still goes to zero. We have what is called the absolute value theorem. It says that if the absolute value of some terms in a sequence goes to zero, then the terms of the sequence itself must go to zero. Proof uses the squeeze theorem. A n is trapped. It's trapped between the absolute value of a n and minus the absolute value of a n. Now, if the limit of the absolute values is zero, then the negative of the absolute values is just negative one times, a constant times this other sequence. Since the sequence of the absolute values goes to zero, we take negative one times that limit, negative one times zero, 
this too must go to zero. So by the squeeze theorem, AN goes to zero as well, and that's it. Let me give you an example. One of the hard things to do is, given a list of numbers, to find a closed form for the nth term. Let's suppose that we have one half, three-fourths, five-eighths, seven-sixteenths, and so on. What is the nth term? The denominators are all powers of two. So two to the n seems like a good fit for the denominators. The numerators are all odd. So two n minus one would be a good fit there. And that's the formula for the nth term. Let's try that again. Let's start with negative 3 over 1. And then let's do 9 over 2. Uh, negative 27 over let's say 6, positive 81 over 24, negative 243 over 120. Do you see the pattern? It might help if I told you 1 factorial is 1, 2 factorial is 2 times 1, and that's 2. 3 factorial is 3 times 2 times 1, and that's 6. 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, and that's 24. And 5 factorial is 120. The numerators look like powers of 3, but they alternate in sign. So we're going to have something that looks like negative 1 to the n. That gets the sign alternating. 3 to the n gives me powers of 3 divided by n factorial. A sequence is called monotone if it either goes always up or always down. Actually, there's a sequence of terms that refine this concept. The sequence AN is called monotone increasing if AN plus 1 is bigger than or equal to AN. The next term down the line is bigger or equal to. It is strictly monotone increasing if an plus 1 is strictly greater than an. And then we have other terms for monotone decreasing and strictly monotone decreasing. The sequence is called monotone if it's either monotone increasing or monotone decreasing. So, for example, if a sub n is 1 over n, this sequence is strictly monotone decreasing. the sequence a n equals 1 minus 1 over n. The 
is strictly monotone increasing. As another example, if a n is negative 1 to the n over n, this sequence it converges to zero, but it doesn't converge in a monotone way. It is not monotone. A sequence is called bounded above if there exists a number m such that a n never rises above m. We call m an upper bound. So a sequence is bounded above if it has an upper bound. Suppose m is an upper bound. And we have a sequence. Maybe it's not bounded below. But it, uh, so it might go down, down, down every other one, but uh, it never rises above this number. Maybe even never even gets close. That's still an upper bound. You can see that if a function has an upper bound, it could have more than one upper bound. Any number bigger is also an upper bound. There is, of course, corresponding definitions for being bounded below and lower bounds. Let me give you an example. Consider the sequence 1 minus 1 over n. We already know this function tends towards 1. Is 2 an upper bound? Sure, 2 is an upper bound. But so is 1.5. and 1.1. And so is 1. Is any number smaller than 1 an upper bound? Well, the answer is no. 1 is the least upper bound. It's the smallest of all the upper bounds. First, I have to define this. The sequence a n is called bounded if it has both an upper bound and a lower bound. Now, we call L a least upper bound of A n if whenever M is an upper bound. then L is less than or equal to M. So L is the least upper bound if any other upper bound is bigger than or equal to that L. 
in our example, an equals 1 minus 1 over n. The least upper bound, which is often denoted by lub, is 1. m greater than 1 is an upper bound but not a least upper bound. There is, of course, the corresponding terminology for lower bounds and greatest lower bound. We say that L is a greatest lower bound, or GLB, if whenever M is a lower bound, then M is less than or equal to L. These may seem like very simple and innocent concepts, the least upper bound and greatest lower bound. But the existence of these, but the existence of a least upper bound and a greatest lower bound is actually an axiomatic concept in mathematics. The existence of these least upper bound and greatest lower bound is called the completeness axiom. This ensures that you can't have sequences that seem to be converging but have nothing to converge to. There has to be something that they actually converge to if they satisfy that epsilon notion of limit. The following theorem is due to the famous mathematician Weierstrass. Weierstrass didn't start studying mathematics until he was about 50 years old, but he became one of the most important mathematicians of the 19th century. He was also known as a very good teacher. His theorem is, if a n is a bounded and monotone sequence, then it converges. If it has some upper bound and it's always going up, has to converge to something. That's the Weierstrass theorem. Believe it or not, the discovery of the completeness axiom, the existence of these least upper bounds and greatest lower bounds, was an important milestone in mathematics. Mathematicians couldn't claim to properly understand the notion of real number itself until they had that completeness axiom. It's been shown that the real numbers are the unique complete ordered field, up to field isomorphism, up to some nice level of matching between fields. The real numbers are it. They're the only one that is complete and ordered and satisfies the field properties. The field properties include things like the commutative law of addition or the associative law of addition, etc. So in our proof of the Weierstrass theorem, we'll suppose that A1 
N is monotone increasing for definiteness. And has upper bound M. By the completeness axiom, the sequence has a least upper bound L. So here's the picture. We have this least upper bound L, and our sequence is getting closer and closer to it. We'll let epsilon greater than zero be given. Since L minus epsilon is less than L, L minus epsilon is not an upper bound. So if we choose some epsilon, L minus epsilon won't be an upper bound. It will have to, the sequence will have to rise above that value at some time, somewhere along the line. And there exists N, a natural number, such that A sub N is above L minus epsilon. But remember the sequence is monotone increasing. So if it's above at one point, it'll have to remain above because it only goes up. A sub N will be greater than L minus epsilon for all N bigger than or equal to this big N. Let's rearrange this sequence and see what this means. If we move this L over, we can see that AN minus L is bigger than minus epsilon. And since these are smaller than L, this will be smaller than zero, and zero is smaller than epsilon. That means the absolute value of AN minus L is less than epsilon. But now we've just shown that the limit of the sequence AN is equal to L. And that's what it means to converge. Let's look at some examples here. The sequence 1 over N is both monotone, it's monotone decreasing, and bounded. Also, it clearly converges to zero. n squared over n plus 1 equals a n. What does this sequence do? At 1, you get a half. At 2, you get 4 thirds. At 3, you get 9 fourths. This thing's going to keep going up, up, up. It's monotone but it is not bounded. Newton, when he invented calculus, did not have a proper understanding of the notion of limit. And he couldn't, because he didn't understand the completeness property of the real numbers. Bishop Berkeley complained that Newton's idea of fluxions were the ghosts of departed quantities. Of course, Bishop Berkeley was right. There was a problem at the foundations of mathematics that Newton was glossing over. Newton may, Sir Isaac Newton may have known this, 
And that might be why he tried so hard to work his theorems into a geometric proof form. Those forms were considered to be rigorous, and he knew his theory lacked rigor, so he phrased it in terms that were quite rigorous at times. It took over 200 years before a proper understanding of the notion was to be had, and hence a proper understanding and a foundation for the concept of limit and the theory of calculus that you now have. Just one more concept I would like to introduce today, and that is the concept of a geometric sequence. The idea of a geometric sequence is that you start with any number you wish. The next number is the previous number times some factor r called the common ratio. You keep multiplying on factors of r to get to the next term in the sequence. In this particular setup, we have a1 is a, a2 is a times r, a3 is a times r squared, and so on. The closed form will be a n is a times r to the n minus 1. It is sometimes customary when dealing with geometric series to start with 0 instead of 1. That way, the index and the power will match, and that's okay, just as long as you're dealing with a set that has a definite beginning and increments by 1. Here's an example. Suppose a1 is 3, a2 is 3 halves, a3 is 3 fourths, and so on. You can see that a2 divided by a1 is a half. a3 divided by a2 is also a half. The common ratio is 1 half. So on this particular sequence, a n will be 3 times 1 half to the n minus 1. 